Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Corinne, and I will be your moderator this evening. I'm excited to welcome Ali Oramchian, founding attorney and dental medical counsel, for an update on law updates that you need to know. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over just some very quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section or in the chat, and we will answer them live at the end. And one last thing, CE is not available for this webinar live or on demand. Ali, welcome. I will pass on over to you now. Awesome. Thank you, Corinne. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. So uh, I know we're you know in the middle of March, and we wanted to kind of give you this information as things have sort of come about where we've got a little bit more clarity on all the different law updates that you need to know about nationwide. So we're going to go into uh, pretty good detail about these laws. Now, you might ask, well, why, why, this, why this class? Why now? Like, why are we talking about it in March? Like, why didn't we do it in January? Well, there was a lot of things that came out in January that um, we wanted to see sort of how they would actually come into play and how they would um, sort of land with you know the other laws that are that are out there. And what we're seeing is that they are very they are being interpreted very strictly. They are being focused on by the states, you know, sometimes by the federal government as well. So um, we're seeing more and more states. You know, filing uh, um, you know administrative actions or different administrative types of you know sending this administrative types of letters to our doctors asking them to you know verify that they are actually doing you know the things that they need to do as far as these new rules are concerned. So we want to go through these in detail with you. Um, we're going to get through as many states as possible, uh, you know, with the various rules. And so it's important if you see your state's name and you still don't fully understand the details of it, um, it's really important for you to just raise your hand uh, at some point, reach out to the HR for Health team or me and someone will kind of get back to you with information on the specificity of those rules in your state. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of our doctors don't even know that their states have these rules. So, so we wanna go into deep detail about all of that. Um, uh, this is a picture of my family. My wife, uh, as some of you may know, is a pediatric dentist here in the Bay Area. So uh, I continually live your life. So I know how hard it is uh, when you are a practicing dentist uh, or if you're an office manager on the phone uh, today. Uh, but it's, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot to manage. There's a lot to juggle. But the important thing is that uh, we're going to break that down for you so that it is very clear. And then hopefully you can ask for assistance uh, or, or, you know, or help in other ways to get, you know, um, to get right with a lot of these rules so that you are not running afoul of the new laws. Um, but I totally understand. And the, the good thing about the questions is, you know, as Corinne mentioned, you know, go ahead and post those if you have any questions at all about how this, you know, these rules impact your practice and I can answer them for you. As Corinne mentioned, I'm a dental attorney. This is what I do. Um, I help dentists all around the country with their practices, making sure, you know, you're buying them correctly, you're selling them correctly, you're doing your leases correctly. If you're going into a partnership, uh, you know, figuring that out and how to make sure that your partnership survives uh, the long term. Um, so this is what I do. I help doctors also hire and fire, you know, staff members and the rest of the team. Uh, and then we do a lot of estate planning as well. OK, um, and so let's jump into our agenda. So we're going to talk about the law of this. We're going to spend a lot of time on these law updates. And then we're going to talk about at the very end how to prep for the year. Um, as we sort of kind of get to, you know, between now and the end of the year, it's important to make sure that you're doing things right so that as rules change again next year, you're already ahead of the game. OK, all right. So let's jump in. Uh, the one that you may have heard uh, the most about is the pay ranges that now must be listed in many job postings around the country. As many of you know, a number of states and local municipalities have also passed laws restricting an employer's ability to um, to either seek or consider a job applicant salary history during the recruiting and hiring process. Um, that was sort of how all of this got started. And then some jurisdictions, you know, started to enact what they call pay transparency laws that now require 
that employers disclose the pay range in the position. So it started with, hey, you can't ask about someone's you know, salaries in their previous position to now you got to give me the pay range as well, which may, you know, not be as bad as it sounds, quite honestly, because I think you can still give a range uh, and you might exclude people who either, uh, you know, are way too overqualified or maybe, you know, aren't qualified at all and don't feel like they fit in that in that range. Um, either way, it's, it's you know, it, it might be good. But the, the importance of this is that, you know, you actually do it. And so let's jump in. So New York City uh, itself requires salary ranges and job postings. Uh, this was effective actually November of last year. Uh, New York, Westchester County uh, requires, you know, pay information in various job postings. Um, and that was also, you know, uh, early November of last year. Uh, in California, starting January 1st of this year, you know, if you have 15 employees or more, you have to include the position's pay scale in a job posting. But all employers, no matter, you know, how many employees you have, must provide it if an, if an applicant asks for it. So it's important to remember that. In Rhode Island, when applicants request uh, um, uh, or, or, or prior to discussing, you know, compensation, um, you know, you have to kind of provide some of that information. Employees upon hire, if the employee moves into a new position uh, or upon the employee's request, you also have to provide it to them as well. So, so they have, Rhode Island has laws for people who are just applicants and also for employees, current employees who may want to change jobs and whatnot. Uh, Washington State requires pay ranges in, in uh, job postings as of January of this year as well. Um, and this could be anything from minimum to maximum salaries or hourly wages, um, but they have to be posted in all job openings. Okay, so Colorado had this actually back in January of 21, where all employers must include hourly or salary information. Uh, so that's important. Connecticut, same thing, it was October of 21. Uh, Maryland was October of 2020, and then Nevada was October of 2021. So, um, so keep those in mind. We do um, assume, because we have seen this in other rules, that there are going to be uh, more states that are going to revise their laws. Um, so the ones that we uh, feel either have a salary history restriction currently or are about to pass one are Alabama, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Maine, uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, Missouri, Nevada, New Jersey, uh, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, we, talk, we just talked about Vermont and Washington. So if you are in one of the states that I mentioned and you want more information about either the transparency laws or uh, you know, disclosing and, or asking about pay ranges in employment, let us know and we will walk you through that, okay? All right, so now let's talk about job descriptions. Uh, you know, many of you are still hiring, you know, because your offices are either growing or to replace somebody. So when it's time to hire this new employee, the last thing you want to worry about and spend time doing is writing a job post. So HR for Health has a ton of uh, predetermined job descriptions. Uh, to kind of relieve you of the stress of having to sort of deal with this and juggle it because it can be very difficult to write these job descriptions, but they are very, very important, right? They're important for a couple of reasons. One, they're super important for the employee so they know exactly what job they're doing in the office. And I know a lot of times, you know, we may look at this and be like, well, they're a receptionist or they're an insurance coordinator or they're, you know, a tech, you know, or, or a rover. Well, those are great titles, but knowing what they do inside those job descriptions in your specific office may be different, right? So, so it's important to detail those. Now, the good news is, is that at HR for Health, we've got it all listed already. So we've got a really in-depth job description that you can go through and then you just delete stuff that don't apply, okay? And that uh, saves you a ton of time because deletion is a lot easier than having to write it yourself, right? So, so this allows you to job, you know, fill the job quiz faster, uh, allows you to not stress out about it uh, because it is uh, you know, stressful to write these job descriptions because you might forget something. But then more importantly, at the end, it's also a good uh, litigation mitigation tool 
uh, that allows you to avoid problems, you know, uh, with employees as far as the law is concerned. So, um, so HR product has all that in the software. We provide it for your specific, you know, um, uh, you know, specialty. If you are in a specialty, and if you're not, uh, we've got it for general practices as well. All right, now let's go to the thing that gets most dentists in trouble nationwide, and it's this thing called wage and hour. Um, it's a catch-all. Okay, it's a catch all. It includes all different kinds of things. But basically, if there's any opportunity for you to have mispaid someone, uh, even $1, um, then, uh, then it falls under these wage and hour uh, rules. Um, and so, so there, are, there are a lot of different ones. There are ones that are way more important than, than others. And so, um, so, you know, things like unclaimed wages law, like I'm not worried about that. Most dental practices don't have any problems with paychecks not being picked up or, um, or you know, uh, paychecks that are, you know, let, uh, you, know, you know, become void because, you know, somebody doesn't cash it. Um, there are some rules, some states are passing around that, but again, super, super minor, inconsequential kind of problem in, um, in dental. So we're, we won't even need to really talk about that. That being said, you know, a lot of states are starting to change their rules regarding final wage payments. So let's say the employee quit, or let's say they uh, got fired. You know, what are those rules, right? What are those rules and, and how does it apply? Those are changing. Um, and some states like California have very specific rules already. And, and, you know, they're very hard rules, you know, whether it's three days or you have to pay somebody the same same uh, day. Uh, but some other states have really relaxed rules. You know, sometimes the last paycheck can be paid on the next payroll, which might be two weeks from now. And, and sometimes it's even longer than that. Um, so a lot of those have changed um, and there's a lot of penalties attached to them. So, um, so just kind of keep that in mind. I'm gonna go through some states that whose laws uh, have changed or are changing. So if you hear your state, please reach out and we can chat about it if you have any questions about it, of course. Um, so, uh, so I'll give you an example. Maine's final paid law uh, was changed that requires employers with 11 or more employees to pay those uh, employees all unused paid vacation accrued, you know, all of those things you know, starting uh, January 1 of 23, right? So they're big changes, they're big changes. So Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, South Dakota, Virginia, um, those uh, have rules that are changing. Uh, Alaska uh, says they will in the future. Same thing with Arizona. Um, you know, California has its rules, of course, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware says, um, uh, their laws will change as well. Hawaii says their laws will change soon. Um, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, um, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Maryland's laws will change. So they haven't changed yet, but they will. Um, same thing with Michigan, Minnesota, and Missouri. Um, but Massachusetts, Montana, you know, those uh, have, uh, you know, their rules as well. So now the rest of the states, if you didn't hear your name, they're, you know, you, um, other than North Dakota and Oregon, every other state that I, if I didn't mention it, is going to have rules that will change in the future. So what that means is that it's not changing today, uh, but it will likely change at some point in the next year or two, because so many states are changing them, right? So just keep an eye out for that. Um, look at our newsletters and, and things, you know, webinars like this, because we'll go through that in detail and give you um, some good information. Uh, so, so meal breaks laws are also changing nationwide. Um, some states already have really strict, you know, uh, rest breaks and meal breaks, um, but many states do not. And so now we are seeing major changes there. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind as well, because if you hear noise in your state, like in Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, you know, if you hear anything like this, um, it's important that you quickly revise your policies if you need to, to account for these meal and rest breaks. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as, you know, making sure the lunch starts at a certain time and ends at a certain time uh, versus kind of letting them pick when they want to go to lunch. And so there's a lot of cool strategies that minimize your risk. So if you have any questions about wage and hour, 
you know, let me um, let, let us know and we'll, we'll walk you through it. Now, final pay regulations, as many of you know, when you need to pay an employee a final paycheck, it always, almost always seems to happen and need to happen very, very quickly. So the last thing you wanna do is try to figure out um, what you need to pay them in terms of hours, uh, paid vacation, potentially PTO, um, any uh, reimbursements, you know, things of that nature. So, so with that said, right, with that said, we, um, you know, HR for Health has a system in place where, you know, when you need to run the final paycheck, it calculates all the things that, you know, needs to be calculated in your state and including vacation and PTO and all that, because they're going to be using our clock and clocking out system. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that you're in good shape. And then in addition to that, not only are you safe from a paycheck financial perspective, which is most of the wage and hour lawsuits, as I mentioned, uh, but you also get the required separation documents that you usually don't get from other companies. So hugely important, hugely important. Um, now we've got a little trick in our system that nobody else has is, you know, it's very easy for employees to claim that no one ever told me to take a break. There's of course defenses at our law firm that we use all the time to, to uh, overcome this, but that is a very expensive venture, even though we are successful at the end. Um, so we have constructed something in our software that does that for you and it covers you. So every time they clock in, they get a reminder to take their breaks. Okay. Um, it's the employer's responsibility, remember, to inform the employees that they have breaks and they need to take them and so on and so forth. So every time they clock in, they get a reminder. Um, and then depending on which state you're in, um, you know, uh, your rest and meal period requirements will show up and be managed differently. So some states, you know, uh, th this is not an issue, so they don't, they don't get a pop-up. But in other states where it is, then you absolutely get this. And, and it's incredible. It's these little things that we do that protect you, you know, on the back end in litigation and otherwise than most other people don't get. And so when you hear a payroll company say, we do HR, it's like, no, they don't, right? They've got some documents for you, but that's it, right? That's it. They just, it's, you know, they're basically a fancy Dropbox of documents, right? That's all. They don't, and they don't even have state documents usually. They just have the federal documents. And so, so it just becomes really, it just becomes really complex. But, you know, because we're specialists in healthcare and more specifically in dental, we're able to do a lot of this, you know, on the back end without anybody really noticing, which is why it makes it so great. Uh, all right, security and privacy laws. This is really getting a lot of action uh, because of various lawsuits around around the country, especially in the, in the law in Illinois last year, where um, there was a ton of security issues uh, regarding you know biometric data and so on and so forth. So that's like things where you know you use your eyeball or your fingerprints or some other you know you know uh, you know biometric kind of device to um, to allow you or your employees to log in to a system, um, and so we see that sometimes with HR doc you know, uh, companies where they say, oh, you know, every person can use their thumbprints. Well, the lawsuits and things that came about had to do, amongst other things. You know what's being done with this data, right? If I'm putting my fingerprint in this random software, where is it going? Who has access to it? What are they doing with it? You know, same thing with you know everything else. And so, so you know, it's it's a um, it's a big area. We've never done that for this reason and many other reasons. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's important to have a software where it's purely it's it's simple, right? Your username, login. You know, it's, it's tied to IP address, so no one can log in and stuff from home, uh, you know, and clock in and clock out. So so you want to keep it simple and straightforward in there, because the last thing you want is to be that guinea pig, like, you know, that business was in Illinois. Um, and so, again, um, you know, hugely important, uh, you know, to do it. Now, if you insist on doing biometric, you know, types of devices on any of your dental equipment or anything else, in addition to, let's say, your HR, which again, we don't recommend, um, you got to have informed consents and various other things in writing that, um, that allow you to collect that data. And then you got to make sure that the company you're dealing with 
is uh, reputable and so on and so forth so that you know you 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 know what they're doing with the data as opposed to kind of not using it so 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 we know there's a lot of doctors around the country who think biometric stuff is cool uh, but it's not really worth it you know in terms of time clocks or HR because of these lawsuits that we predicted many years ago and now are coming to fruition you know uh, across the board um, and so um, that on top of the administrative headaches with time clocks and whatnot that are biometric, it's just it just it's really not worth it um, to deal with it. But if you use you know the HR for Health time clock system, it's tied to benefits, and so every time they log in and log out, it keeps track of all of that, and that is a huge huge advantage because right because now many states are starting to mandate the use of time clocks. Um, and the reason is, is because of what I just mentioned, they've all, they've passed all these rules regarding uh, PTO and vacation and sick leave and now 401ks and all this stuff. And it's all tied back to the number of hours somebody works, right? It's tied to the number of hours somebody works. So if you're not keeping really good track of that, it ends up being a little bit of a problem. And by a little bit, I mean a big problem, right? Because, um, because that's where lawsuits and complaints and all that kind of start. Um, and so it's really important that you know, the time clock talks with these other benefits and it's all assimilated into one cohesive system, which is exactly what we've um, you know, developed on at HR for Health. On top of that, right, then the employment handbook that I hope many of you have and if you don't uh please raise your hand and get one from us uh you know it's part of our uh, uh software so it's free to you we customize it you know just don't be that person that doesn't have one it's really really important that you that you have one but your manual your handbook has to match the policies that you're going to do on the timekeeping side and that match your locality and whatnot so 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 all in all, when we do all of that, it just ends up working out really, really well um, because they say the same thing. And so when somebody raises their hands and complains and says, no, no, nope, I was never told that I could take a break or, or that lunch was ever provided. And, you know, I've never eaten lunch in five years, of, you know, working here, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff that people say, you have the data to, to, to help you uh, resolve it and, and be successful. Okay. All right. Times clock, time sheets. We just talked about that. Um, huge area of concern that I see in your in practices that I would love to uh, eradicate, um, and I hope you know uh, it doesn't happen in your office. But if it does, please make sure you're working on it. Um, is you know softwares or or things that allow the employee to edit it, uh, or or more importantly, if it doesn't allow the employee to edit it with approval, that they require you as the business owner or office manager to edit it for them, okay? Um, so this is a, potentially a huge problem area uh, because you know oh, the last thing we want is for you to change timesheets and hope that there's some sort of documentation that proves that you can, you know, that you got asked to change the timesheet because it was an error or whatnot. It just, um, it just causes a lot of potential problems. And so, so, um, so make sure you're careful about that. Um, you know, I think it's time to get away from the manual timesheets and punch cards and things of that nature. They tend to get destroyed, not very reliable um, and uh, not very modern either. Um, doesn't give you the checks and balances that you need between, you know, the hourly time and your budget and the payroll to make sure that nothing crazy is happening. Okay, so so again, hugely important. Um, you know, the HR for Health system uh, allows the employees to make the change to the time clock, but before it gets approved or before it gets finalized, it goes to a manager or the doctor for approval so they can review it, make sure all that is good, and then once it gets approved you know, it gets reported. So again, little things that make a big difference. All right, let's go to the federal government now. Um, the, uh, there, there are a ton of rules being passed uh, at a national level, also state level, but at a national level, making discrimination laws much more um, uh, severe. Uh, and so, you know, uh, there's a lot of things, you know, you can't discriminate uh, for now, even more than before. Uh, in, in four states, uh, Louisiana, um, uh, uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, Missouri, Massachusetts, and Illinois, uh, their hairstyle is a discrimination type thing. So if you discriminate against someone because of their hairstyle, 
then uh, then that's a problem, you know? Um, and so, so just, you know, it's important to know that. Um, for tonight's webinar, I was gonna do a mohawk, uh, but I just don't have the hair. So no matter what I do, I can never get it there. So, so but you could have, you know, you can discriminate against me, I'm not your employee, but you can't discriminate against uh, employees. So uh, with, with hairstyles in those four states, my point being that there are rules that are changing all the time when it comes to discrimination rules. Um, emergency leave responders, uh, they have uh, protections now. Uh, they've always had them in many states, but now it's becoming a little bit broader nationwide. Um, you've got to be very reasonable with your accommodations for disabilities. Um, that includes disabilities that occur in the office or disabilities that occur out of the office, right? So, so if somebody hurts themselves, you know, breaks their back, their knees, you know, something of that nature, skiing or surfing or whatnot, um, if it rises to the level of a disability, then you've got to provide reasonable accommodations to that. Um, now, you know, I think a lot of people have forgotten about the Me Too movement, uh, but it's still there and it's a very real thing, uh, despite COVID sort of overshadowing it uh, for the past three years. Um, so states have expanded the applicability of various sexual harassment laws. Um, and so now you just have to be, you know, uh, even more careful for those of you that are in states where you are required to do a sexual harassment webinar every two years, uh, then, uh, you know, just remember those two years are this year usually, or sometimes it was last year, depending on your state. So you may have to redo them because uh, it's every, every two years. Um, again, you know, these are things we have in your manual. There's things that are tracked. In the software so you know when you start to you know get to the point where things need to be renewed hr for health will let you know we'll let you know all right in uh, dc connecticut washington colorado illinois maryland massachusetts new york and oregon um you know there's been massive changes in the family leave laws everything from the amount of time you can take off for parental medical or bereavement leave um, to timelines within which, you know, uh, those leaves must be approved or denied by the employer, right? So huge differences, huge differences. Um, a lot of states, uh, those included, the ones that I read, um, expanded the definition of bereavement, okay? Um, and so, you know, uh, you know in, in a couple of years, in 2025, uh, employers with 25 or more employees um, have to start contributing to certain family leave benefits in certain states. Um, and so again, like the laws are changing. It's becoming like really, really um, much more broad than before. Um, now who qualifies? Again, it's very state specific, but typically the expansions from what we see have been to spouses or domestic partners, uh, a child of course, parents or parents-in-law, uh, siblings, all right, grandparents or grandchild. Okay, so there's um, there's some expansion there. Uh, some of those things were not necessarily there before, um, and so depending on your state, uh, again, those things have, have have expanded. All right, uh, new hire forms for your employees, and and even if you're not hiring new employees, you need to make sure that you have all the documents, right? So on average, there's about twelve to seventeen documents per state. Depending on your state, it might be closer to 12 or it might be more, um, but in total, there's a lot of documents that you need to give to your employees. And uh, there's been about 40 updates to these. Uh, if you go back to your office and you might be in your office when you're listening to this, if you don't have 12 to 17 documents per employee in your uh, employment files, okay, then, um, that's a problem. That's that's the first step in really big problems as far as potential lawsuits and complaints and whatnot. So you got to cover yourself. So you got to have these 12 to, to 17 documents. There's like I mentioned over 40 that we recommend that are highly you know uh, recommendable um, and uh, and we want you to have them because they protect the office in various ways, whether it's for social media, this and that. But you know the 12 to 17 are like the minimum that you need to you, you need to have. Um, so just kind of keep that uh, please in mind. Um, everything from paid family leave to so sexual harassment to the withholding forms, as I mentioned over the last many slides, have changed. Right. So so I left this. For the last slide of this section, 
because I want you to know how important it is. Um, that is really the first step along with the employment manual in making sure that you are compliant, okay? All right, so in summary, you know, before we get to a place where, you know, um, you know maybe we, you know, open it up for some questions and, and things of that nature, um, I wanna talk about uh, the things you need to do in you know this year uh, to get sort of up to date as you prepare for the end of the year, okay? As you prepare for the end of the year, and and you might say, Ali, why am I doing stuff now for the end of the year? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, so a couple of things. One is it's never too early to start. The earlier you start to get HR compliant, the safer you will be for the rest of the year, okay? And like a lot of other things, you know these HR rules. Uh, build on one another. And we're anticipating a whole new slew of them in January of next year that is going through the bill process now and the congressional process now at the state levels and at the federal level. And so we know it's not going to get easier and then it's going to be even harder for you to get compliant. So by getting compliant now with the basics that are in place today, uh, then allows you to easily kind of build on that, especially if you're on HR for Health, because they will automatically be built into the software for you, right? So again, really, really easy in that sense. Okay, so the first thing, right, the first thing is you want to update your handbook with all the new laws in your state or local jurisdiction, okay? So hugely important, hugely important. We see so many doctors you know, use generic, you know, um, employment manuals that they, you know, get from random sources that is not only specific to their state, but it's also not specific to dental. Um, and remember, you know, you can't go to like, you know, a payroll company uh, just because they have dentists and others, doctors as clients, they don't necessarily, they're not going to necessarily give you a dental specific employment handbook they're gonna give you the same handbook that they may give you know, a lot of other businesses that they work with. So, so again, really important to, to get something that is very dental specific, right? Very dental specific, and it's customized to you. Um, the nice thing about HR for Health is that every year that the laws change, your employment manual also changes with it uh, without really any extra work from you, um, unless your basic in, you know, office, you know, terms and policies have changed. So your hours change, your number of days that you're open have changed, uh, or you may want to change your policies, then at that point, the, the, the handbook um, becomes, uh, becomes really uh, vital. Okay. All right. Number two is updating the new hire checklist. Now, now again, people hear new hire checklist and they go, oh my gosh, well, I'm, I'm not hiring anybody or the last person I hired was six months ago. So it's too late. Um, that's not the case, right? That's not the case. So you want to make sure that you are, uh, that you have all the required forms of 12 to 17 that on average per, per state. And then you want to make sure that the employees have signed it, they've reviewed it and, and whatnot. Now, it, it, if you're going to do this in paper, it's going to be a real pain because you're not going to remember who you've given it to, who's going to give it back to you, when are they going to give it back to you? Um, and then it's going to, you know, you're going to forget and it's going to become more and more of a problem um, because you're going to have it for some people and then you're not going to have it for others. And then, and then as the rules change, you're going to have to update it. So how do you manage it and how do you do it well? Well, you do that through our software because it's all on there. The employees log in and log out. Uh, they go in, they fill out the new hire forms. Uh, they submit them. It's uh, it's there, you know, uh, in PDF format. Uh, so and it's time stamped and everything. So so you now have full record of it. If somebody starts a document and they don't finish it, or more importantly, they don't um, they don't start it at all, uh, you'll know because it'll tell you that they haven't finished that document uh, and or or even opened it, and then and then you can kind of follow up with them. Uh, so it's very easy to do reminders and things of that nature in the software, um, as opposed to uh, you know as opposed to uh, um, you know trying to track it down on paper. But these new hire checklists, if there's anything that I'm that you've learned tonight, anything at all, this is the time to go through it. And this is the time to make sure that you're all totally compliant, okay? All right, uh, ensuring minimum wage is updated. We didn't talk about minimum wage a whole lot tonight because 
uh, you know, it differs everywhere, but I wanna make sure everyone understands this because I get a lot of questions about this and it can be confusing, so I wanna be clear. So there is a federal minimum wage law, you know, that the federal government puts out there. And then each state can have its own minimum wage. It has to be higher than the feds because the feds is the lowest, uh, but uh, they can do that. Uh, and then each locality can also have its own minimum wage rules, uh, usually higher than the states, okay? So, so at, a, at a federal, state, county, and city perspective, there can be multiple minimum wage. And of course, the minimum wage that, you that applies to you is where your business is located, Okay, what city your business is located and what the highest minimum wage rule is in your city, your county, your state, or the federal government. Okay, so some people look at this and go, well, the federal government says it's $10 an hour or whatever it is right now, uh, and I'm paying everyone well more than that, so it doesn't matter. But they forget that the state may have a different rule, the county may have a different rule, and even the city that they're in may have a different rule. And so, again, hugely important. Now, I'm going to go through the states that are changing these rules. Arkansas, Arizona, California, Colorado, Delaware, Illinois, uh, Maryland, uh, uh, Missouri, Massachusetts, Minnesota, uh, Michigan, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico. Ohio, Rhode Island, uh, South Dakota, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington, okay? These states have changed their uh, city state requirements when it comes to minimum wage. So it's hugely important for you to kind of keep an eye on that. The other reason, you know, minimum wage rules are important has to do with exempt employees, all right? So if you have exempt employees uh, for, you know, de depending on the exemption, but the exempt employees must be paid at least double minimum wage. Okay, double minimum wage. So, you know, if some if minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour or seventeen dollars an hour or whatever it is in your in your area, you got to have at least double that for them to be exempt. So, not only do they have to be on salary and fit the requirements of all the job tasks, but on in addition, they also have to you know be double minimum wage. So, so again. That's why minimum wage is important. I know many of you are paying well above minimum wage, uh, but uh, you know it, it impacts different things. Okay. All right. Number four: um, uh, review employee certifications and trainings to make sure they are not expired. You are correct. Many of you are going to say it's not my responsibility to make sure that my hygienist has her licensure or my DA and RDA, you know, have done their you know, uh, CPRs and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and the answer is, you, it should be their responsibility and it is their responsibility, uh, but it's also your responsibility because it's a felony in many states to touch a patient if your license is expired or if, uh, if uh, you know, it, it's been, you know, revoked or anything of that nature. Um, and so, and we see a lot of employees because of the cost of renewing some of these licenses. Sometimes it's they forget or they're lazy or they can't afford it or whatever. There's a lot of reasons why, uh, you know, an employee may not sign or fill out their, you know, certifications and their renewal applications or whatnot. So, so just be careful about that because if that's the case, then you, you know, there is going to be liability for you as the practice owner. Uh, there could be liability for your office manager as well, uh, uh, because he or she may be deemed to uh, to know this information and they, you know, still let the, you know, the employee touch a patient. Um, and of course, there's liability for the employee as well. Okay. All right. Next slide is ensuring tra correctly tracking of benefits, including PTO, sick leave, et cetera. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the number one lawsuit against dentists is something called wage and hour, uh, because usually there's a um, there's a, an error in some calculation that is done uh, with regard to an employee's pay, their bonus, their vacations, or whatnot. Um, it's not worth it. It's super complicated. Uh, you know, if they go, um, if the employee works through, you know, uh, two different um, uh, uh, payroll periods, for example, because they're making up hours or whatnot, 
Um, you know, it brings up different issues. So it's really important that you track it correctly. And we automate all of that through the clock in, clock out system that HR for Health has. So you don't have much to worry about when it comes to that. But um, I would say, keep an eye on that. If you don't have a good system for tracking PTO, sick leave, so on and so forth, um, let one of our team members know, okay? All right, so how can HR for Health help? Um, well, we've talked about a lot of things that have changed, uh, a lot of things that they can do to help in that regard. Um, basically, it breaks down to you know six or seven categories. Um, it's you know the goal of HR for Health, why I created it, was to prevent you from having to deal with all these kind of pitfalls that we're talking about um, by you know um, making sure that we're walking you through the proper steps to manage your HR compliance and all the rule changes, right? So we hear stories all the time across, you know, um, the country where employees are, um, you know, are, are coming late to work, you know, they're tardy or they're absent or they don't fill out forms, you know, then they turn around, uh, you know, and either get trouble with the federal government or the states come in. Um, and so our HR advising, you know, is available all the time for questions, uh, for you. Uh, so, so that's wonderful. If they, for some reason, can't handle it, they will transfer you to a lawyer um, and all of that is part of your membership. Uh, we will customize a handbook for you. Uh, and then, of course, as we talked about, you know, it absolutely eliminates almost all wage and hour claims if you are doing things correctly in the system. And then, and that's, uh, and then that's a pretty, pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting thing. Now, as we end, and I always like to leave you guys with a gift, our most popular article the past few years has been this handbook update checklist. So, so that's right. So for those of you who want to try to do it on your own, or you've got a handbook and you want to just verify that everything is in there, uh, go ahead and take a picture of that uh, QR code. Um, you know, you put your name and email address, and then you will get the article and the checklist in your email box so that you can use that moving uh, move forward. Um, it was by far our most popular, you know, uh, you know, article and, and, and information that we provided the last couple of years. And so, so I wanted to give that to you guys. Um, and, uh, and of course, if you don't have a manual or, you know, uh, trying to fix the one you have is just too much or it's taking you too long, um, then just let us know. We can, we can help you. All right. All right, Karen, that's all I have. It's been a pleasure, guys. If you have any questions about HR for Health or you want to get in touch with someone there or me, um, you know, feel free to go to our website, hrforhealth.com, uh, fill out a, a, a form, and uh, one of our team members will, will get in touch with you. Amazing. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions already, but just a reminder, if awesome. you, anyone does have questions, just type them on in, in the Q and a se uh, section on zoom. So it looks like, um, Heidi says, thank you for the handbook checklist and for all of the other good info. So thank you again. My pleasure. <laughs> Um, Jerry asked, what do you suggest will be the best retirement plan for a dental practice with five employees? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jerry. Um, I'll tell you, here's kind of the reality. Um, there are, you know, most laws right now, uh, most states are passing laws with, re with regard to 401k because so many people, re uh, you know, uh, realize that, you know, through COVID that they were really not in a place, uh, uh, where they could retire. And so, th so the states are forcing this upon, you know, employees uh, and employers. Um, if your state is requiring it, then you have a couple of options. Um, you can uh, set up usually what the state offers, which is typically terrible uh, for the employees and for you, uh, or you can go with sort of a private 401k plan. Now, the good news is that you don't have to match. If you, if you can't afford it, the office is not big enough yet or, or, or whatnot. Um, you just have to offer it so that the employees are able to put money into their 401k, but there doesn't need to be necessarily an employer match component, okay? Um, so that's important for you to realize. Now, if you want to maximize what you're putting away, uh, then you want to do something called a 401k profit sharing plan. And that's really cool because you can put 
you know, 50, 60, $70,000 uh, away, depending on your situation, your family structure, if your wife or uh, your, your spouse or kids or whatnot are in the office, there's a lot of fun ways of doing that. And, um, and HR for Health is a really good solution for that, a company that we've negotiated really hard with. And uh, we've got rates uh, that um, uh, imply that we have a billion dollars under management. So they're like super, super low. Uh, and we pass all that on to our clients. So, so Jerry, reach out to our team and we'll, we'll get you hooked up. We'll get you hooked up there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I think you might have touched on this, but Heidi asked, can we get a list of the 12 to 17 documents that we need to have in our employee files? Yes, yes. So Heidi, reach out to uh, reach out to HR for Health uh, through that those links, and uh, one of our team members will will you know, depending on your state and stuff will get it to you. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, another question is how long to keep employees' records after termination? So we recommend seven years uh, because the IRS requires you know some some documents to be kept for seven years. Most states are you know, somewhere between three to five years technically, but because the IRS requires financial records to be kept for seven and employment records are tied to payroll and taxes and all that, we're recommending seven years, right? We're recommending seven years. Now, Now, you know, um, if you're on HR for Health, it's all there forever, you know, it just goes sort of inactive if an employee gets terminated or retires or whatnot. Uh, but if you're not, then yes, I would say keep them somewhere super safe so that they don't get destroyed or, uh, you know, um, ruined by, you know, you know, water damage or fire or anything like that. So. Okay. Our yeah. next question is from Jenna who asks, are we required to have HIPAA training once a year or how often, uh, she came in a few minutes late. So she wanted to just check on that. Not sure if you went over that in the beginning. Yeah, no, Jenna, you didn't. Uh, you you didn't miss this. We didn't bring this topic up uh, in the beginning. Uh, it's a great question. So, so you know, depending on your state, uh, you know, HIPAA, you know, training is always sort of a good idea. Most um, most offices do it like once every couple of years. Um, uh, but you know, there are some states where there are requirements. Um, and especially if you have new employees that are coming and being hired all year long, uh, they may never have gotten their HIPAA training and certification. So I think it's a good idea. There are some really cool solutions out there now that, you know, it's, it's not like your grandfather's HIPAA training anymore. You know, they're, they're sort of more modern, you know, they're technology based, uh, easy for employees to do. Um, and, and more importantly, easy for the office to do to be compliant, right? Um, and so it used to be that, you know, you'd have to jump through a bunch of hoops and have someone come into the office, do a presentation. And it was just sort of an all day thing. You, you lost out on, um, you know, clinical time and production. Uh, but there's like really cool modern ways. And, um, and Jenna, if you reach out again to HR for Health, uh, we'll get you a couple of names of companies for you to interview and see if it's a good fit. Thank yeah. you. Helene asks, what kind of privacy recommendations do you need or have? So Helen, do you, can you give me some more detail about what kind of question you're asking? Um, because there's so much in terms of privacy that we could talk about. If you don't mind, just spend a few minutes and just give us a little bit more detail about that question. And if someone wanted to contact you, could they just go through HR for Health in this link that you have right here? Or do you have a specific contact information that you would like to share? Yeah, it's yeah, it's absolutely no problem. I'm going to put it in the chat um, so that everyone has my email and office phone number. So if you have any questions about this, um, just let me know. I will send it out to everybody. Let me oh, perfect. Okay. Now. Um, and, and just to clarify though, if they're looking for the employee manual, um, that, yeah. that is through the link, correct? That is through, yeah, that is okay. through HR for help. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Go through the, go through the link and they will, they will hook you up. There's a couple of different options. Um, if, uh, you know, in terms of costs and things of that nature, if, if you want HR for help without payroll, um, it's uh, like around 250 a month, depending on number of employees you have. Uh, if you want payroll, it's slightly more than that, but, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the strongest uh, and, and most affordable option as far as both of those is, is concerned. But, but you don't need to do payroll. If you love your payroll company, which I've never heard anybody say, but <laughs> if you love your <laughs> payroll company, stay with them, uh, but make sure your HR is clean because it's, it's the HR that's the liability, not, not the payroll side. 
All right. And um, Helen actually did respond. The privacy recommendations she's looking for is personnel and their health records. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great question. I was hoping you would be asking about this. So, so when it comes to privacy, you know, personnel records, which are like the HR documents have to be kept separate from the medical records. Okay. Uh, And when I say separate, I mean, in a, you know, different, you know, uh, uh, file cabinet, if you're still kind of doing things on paper. Um, And the reason is that someone, you know, that might need to see something in the personnel record, like a team lead or an office, you know, administrator or whatnot, uh, uh, may accidentally see medical records of that same employee that they shouldn't have access to. And so since it's confidential, they need to be kept separate in different areas, you know, uh, different cabinets and whatnot, so that there's no, you know, chance of sort of cost contamination. Um, again, you know, if you're on HR for Health, that's not a problem because everything is electronic, it's separated, you know, certain people have access to certain things, most people don't have access to everything. So it just, um, it just sort of protects you more in that regard. I think that wraps up our questions this evening. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was great, everyone. Yeah, those were those were some really, really great questions. And, uh, and, and, you know, and please, you know, this is why we're here. I mean, we, we do these webinars, you guys, I'm sure saw all the stuff we did during COVID. We want to educate you so you don't get in trouble. So you can focus on dentistry and everything else. Uh, so please, if you, if you feel anything from what we talked about today, where you're like, Oh man, I, I don't know if I'm doing it right. Don't take a chance. Just raise your hand, ask for help. We will walk you through it. If it's an easy fix, we'll just tell you how to fix it so you're good to go. If it requires us to do more on the HR side, then we'll you know, talk to you about the software and how to make sure you're compliant and then you know, kind of keep it that way. Um, and if you're doing everything correctly and you just have some random questions, ask us those two. We're, that's what we're here for. <laughs> so. Amazing. A few more que- uh, comments just came in, just thanking you for your time and all of the education and that Everyone just always learns oh. something from you, Michelle oh, said. So sweet. So. <laughs> so sweet. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending, for all the great questions and engagement. And thank you, Ali, for the wonderful presentation this evening. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. We did record tonight's webinar, so we will email the recording out sometime in the next week. So if you want to refer back to anything, you certainly can. We would also appreciate your feedback back via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, everyone. (laughs)